Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, I know we have limited time, so we want to get to our expert speakers today. So welcome to another installment of Webinars for Busy Lawyers, and we're very happy to have you here today. My name is Amy Levine. I'm the Director of Programs and Volunteers at LCL, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar, Mastering Business Development for Lawyers, Best Practices to Win, Keep, and Grow Clients. And before I introduce our presenters, Beth Cazone and Jill Swetchkenbaum, I want to remind you what LCL offers. We provide a range of confidential services to support the legal community's well-being, including one-on-one -on -one consultations with licensed clinicians for mental health and substance misuse challenges, peer support groups, educational programs, and one-on-one -on -one consultations with our law practice advisor on law firm practice management and professionalism. And now I am truly honored to introduce our speakers. First, Beth Cazone is currently the global practice group leader at INTAP, which is an industry leader in law firm marketing, sales, and client services. Prior to INTAP, Beth was the chief strategic growth officer at an AMLAW 200 firm, Goulston and Stores. Beth is a fellow in the College of Law Practice Management, Excellence in Law, Legal Marketing Hall of Fame, and named industry thought leader by National Law Review. She brings decades of experience to today's webinar. She is an author and has published several ABA books, including The Client Interview Playbook, The Law Firm Associate's Guide to Personal Marketing and Selling, Marketing Success. How did she do that? Beth is also an editorial board member on ALM's newsletter, Marketing, the law firm, and is a co-founder of Legal Sales and Service Organization. Welcome, Beth. Jill Zwetschgenbaum is a senior manager of client relations at Gulston and Stores and brings her unique lens into law firms by adopting best practices from two of the most advanced client service industries, hospitality and luxury fitness. As part of her dynamic role within an AMLAW 200 law firm's award-winning business development department, Jill regularly partners with clients and firm's attorneys to support the growth of key relationships and the ongoing delivery of exceptional client service. She leads the firm's client relations function, driving firm initiatives focused on client development, client service excellence, and business intelligence for key clients. And Jill currently serves as the co-chair of the Legal Sales and Service Organization's editorial board. Prior to this, she served on the Legal Marketing Association's Northeast Board Executive Committee. And she is also the co-author of the Law Firm Client Service Interview Playbook, a step-by-step -step guide in incorporating client service interviews into your firm's client relationship management strategy. So a big welcome and thank you for both of, to both of you for presenting today. And just one housekeeping tip at the end of this presentation, we'd love to hear from you, answer your questions. So please use the Q&A for that. And I will hand it over to Jill and Beth. Hi there, thank you so much, Amy. What a warm welcome, I really appreciate it. Uh, Jill and I are especially appreciative that you had us join the LCL webinar series. Um, and we know that this is going to be rapid fire. Amy was very careful to let us know, very busy people. You have a lot of competing priorities. So we're going to try to drill through this in the next half an hour, give some time for question and answer. And then obviously Jill and I are always around if, if there are some questions or comments um, that people want to talk to you about. What you can expect today is exactly what you signed up for. We're going to talk a little bit about, spend a few minutes around how to develop new business, talk about keeping new business, which has never been harder, as we can appreciate, and then how to grow those relationships. And again, spend some time on Q&A. Jill's going to spend a little time on some of the proving strategies for winning clients. I'm going to spend a few minutes on keeping clients, and Jill's going to uh, finish us off with, with growing clients. So with that, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Jill, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, developing developing clients and winning clients. Jill? Thank you so much, Beth. And hi, everybody. I am honored to be here. So first of the steps, winning clients. 
In this section, I'm going to run through the sales and buying process. We're going to talk about ways to build your brand, or if you don't like the word brand, we will talk about ways to amplify your credibility. We are going to talk about the importance of relationships. And did you know that 62% of clients rely on recommendations from colleagues or friends when selecting a law firm? We will also discuss why you need to understand prospects' needs. So you find the problem, you offer your solution. It's a simple formula. We're also going to talk about why you specifically, by honing in on what we call your value proposition. And then I love to say this, it's really not rocket science. We'll be talking about the little things that you can do to increase your wins. So with that said, let's move to the legal services buying process. And this is what your prospects or clients are experiencing on the other end. And these steps highlight the journey from your initial awareness to hiring. So first we have awareness. Prospects learn a firm exists and what their services are. How do they do that? Through your online marketing efforts, through word of mouth, through PR, online presence, in a recent survey, 74% of firms who have robust online presences report a 74% a increase in 70% um, increase in client inquiries as well. So robust online presence, increase of client inquiries. And why awareness? To capture attention, to stand out. Moving on, credibility. This is where you're establishing trust and showcasing your expertise. How? testimonials, case studies, thought leadership, articles, blogs, speaking, podcasts, and why. You have to build confidence in your ability and your firm's ability to handle specific legal matters. So now moving to relationships. You're building a personal connection. How? You care personally. You have consultations. You go to events. You invite prospects to these events. You stay in touch. You make introductions. Why? You have to show that you're reliable. Next, you have a need. A specific issue or need is identified. And by the way, if this doesn't happen, nothing will. So you're proactive, you're responsive, you're doing targeted outreach, you're providing educational content, you're tracking relevant issues in order to be proactive and reach out. And why are you doing this? You're positioning yourself as the best solution to these identified needs. And the last step here is hired. You're being engaged. You want transparency around fees, scope, service model, and obviously a very smooth onboarding process. And last thing here, you'll see the first two we deem as marketing and the second as business development. And we say marketing is this act of one to many. One website hits many, many, many people. Speaking engagement, same thing. Blog posts, same thing. But then you're moving to business development and this is really where the one-on-one, -on -one, tailored, specific outreach based on what you know about the person, what you know about the company, that's where you're going to be spending the most time. So speaking of that, right, we have a balancing act. As your reputation grows, the need for mass marketing diminishes, which allows a shift towards sustaining relationships, and you're effectively leveraging your credibility to attract new clients naturally. And here we have the legal services selling process. So two slides ago, I had just shared the buying process, which is what the clients and prospects go through. And here we have the selling process, which is how we see what the lawyers go through and what we are showing our lawyers as to be the sales process, the process that you, the people listening to this webinar, experience. So with pre-approach, you're understanding the needs, the industry, and the pain points. And then when you're approaching, you're connecting through introductions, background, referrals, thought leadership, events. You're building relationships. You're fostering trust. You're gathering information. You're continuing to communicate. When you present, you're presenting tailored legal solutions and strategies upon identifying said need. When you're in the closing phase, you're formalizing your engagement. You're asking for the business or you know, the opportunity to work alongside this person in helping solve their issues and challenges. And then client service and growth, which we will hit on continuously through this presentation, you're providing the highest level of service, you're seeking feedback, you're identifying slowly and strategically, this is a long game, ways to grow and further ingrain this client. 
And I'll add to that this process on average, it's around 18 months. So this is a very long game, as we just said. And from the pre-approach to effectively the close, we are seeing on average 14 touch points happen. So this isn't you know, a very quick process. We're continuing to look forward and play that long game. And so now back to marketing and maximizing your time doing so. Standing out and expanding your networks means you need to identify what makes you unique. This is called crafting an elevator pitch. And yes, you may be a lawyer at Smith Law Firm handling employment law, but I don't find that to be a very compelling elevator pitch at all. So how about you help clients navigate sophisticated and highly sensitive workplace matters and you counsel on all issues related to the HR life cycle. That to me is a lot more compelling and explains more of what you're doing in a very, you know, not resume way. Now, where are the people who want to hear your elevator pitch? That is where you should be. Identifying those industries, identifying those organizations, spend your time there. And then also create your contact list to stay organized. Utilize LinkedIn, more on that in the next slide, but also being able to strategically connect with contacts, with referrals, with lawyers who are out of state as well. And I find this to be even more so important as we're in New England. Why LinkedIn? In a recent ABA survey, more than 93% of the lawyers surveyed now use LinkedIn. LinkedIn has 900 million users globally, and these include your referrals, your prospects, and your clients. LinkedIn has the ability to help brand yourself as the go-to. You can publicize your victories. You can post, or honestly, you can just repost relevant articles and client alerts. Or if none of that, Stay in the know on what's going on, know what's happening with your clients, with your contacts, with other companies, what's in the industry. It is more important than ever to have this online presence. And now to talk about some very small ways that you can start today helping clients with what I like to call the unmet needs at effectively no cost as well. So leverage your networks to help people who may be looking for a new job and transition to some career, trying to think about the next step, make introductions, listen, essentially spending quality time with prospects outside of that billable hour just further demonstrates your commitment. And as you are doing this, add more substantive value as well. So here are some ways to add value to a client or prospect that also showcases your interest in working with them, your proactiveness, and obviously your, your expertise, right? So offer complimentary audits or assessments, provide briefings, share an upcoming event, an opportunity to speak with this client, maybe feature this client, talk about you know where you're going to speak, inviting them, um, and also thinking about, too, what resources your firm may have that would be of interest to the client, right? Do you have office space in an area where they may not have an office or they have an interest in having a, an off-site retreat, right? Do you have a link to a CLE or a code to a presentation that clients may also find valuable? These are small offerings, too, even if you're not taken up on them, that you're able to put forward that just shows they're top of mind and that you're thinking about them. Also. None of these above, I, I, like we said, the sales process is long. None of these above have immediate ROI, but it's not the point. It's certainly the long game. And then it's also the little things again, right? So back to it not being rocket science, it's the relationship and practicality business. Have lunches, offer tickets. Yes, go to a game or a show with a client, but there are so many clients or people in our business orbit who have little kids, right? Maybe it's tickets to Disney on ice or something similar like that. And that's a small thing that clearly goes a long way as it relates to personal and family. Um, share articles. My favorite line, which everybody here is allowed to steal when you send an article. I saw this and I thought of you. That's it, plain and simple. I like that Beth is laughing. It's my favorite line. She's probably heard it before because I've sent things to her as well. Um, and then people love handwritten notes as well as appropriate. So again, it is always in the little things too, to be able to maximize those wins. 
And I will now pass it to Beth to move on to keeping clients. Sure. Thank you so much. So one of the things we wanted to do was give you some compelling business case and information about why keeping clients is just as important as the time you're spending on obtaining new clients or growing existing ones. Um, and again, we're going to talk a little bit more about both of those. Um, want to give you also just some insight into some of the activities that clients deem add value and then talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is client feedback. Um, you know, the only thing that's constant is change. And uh, do you have a mechanism in place for capturing the changing needs of your clients, the changing priorities of your clients, the changing decision makers with your clients, the changing dynamics of a client fa family, that's family members, that sort of thing. So we're gonna start with what, what Jill has up on the screen here, which is a little bit around the client loyalty. Not surprising, and you're probably seeing this for those of you that have been practicing law for a couple of decades, client loyalty is diminishing. Um, there was some market research from a company called DCMI. And one of the things that they asked was, it, would you go with the same professional services partner or firm that you've used you know, in the past? Five years ago, would you, would you basically change horses today and five years from now? And what you're seeing is there's a sea change in the way clients are actually deciding who their law firms are going to be. They are less sticky. And uh, that is, again, very, very, very interesting. There's also some other, on the next slide, some other really compelling numbers that we wanted to share with you. So if you look at the number one reason by a factor of four of why clients change law firms, it's because they believe they will get better service elsewhere. And we felt like there was a pause that we needed to make there. A factor of four, the number one reason why clients do not rehire a lawyer is because they think they'll get better service somewhere else. Um, we also know that retaining a client saves at least five times the cost of obtaining a new client to replace them. There's also... And again, we can share some statistics if you're interested. This may be confirming what you already know, but we know that happier clients have a higher realization rate, a higher profitability rate, a higher, um, you know, as your retention rate goes up. Um, these things also drive next year's uh, income as well, because when you have happy clients, you have this annuity stream of revenue, if you will, because clients come back they become repeat, and then they also become referral sources, whether they're introducing friends, family, maybe other business colleagues, maybe they're leaving one company and going to another, so you get to continue to represent the existing company, and you get to start working with the new company, but those are the things, and when Jill was talking about the time that it takes for a brand new prospect who hasn't been introduced by, by someone, it can take 15, 16, 17, 18 touches, the life cycle of a new prospect to finding a need, building a relationship and bringing in a piece of business is about 18 to 36 months. Now that timeline does significantly decrease when you have a referral from an existing client. And if you remember, Jill had that uh, buying, um, she basically had a buying scale across where it was like pre-approach, approach, qualify, assess, strategize, present needs, and then get hired. When someone says, do you know a lawyer who's really good at intellectual property protection? And someone says, this, he or she has done this really well. Or does anybody have a good divorce attorney that can help me in something that is a little complicated that's dealing with multi-jurisdictions? Oh, this, this man or woman is terrific at this. You're going through that life cycle of the, of the sales process very quickly. And then it significantly decreases where it's a couple of touches and it's very little time and the turnaround is little. So you're saving in, in many different ways. The next slide is actually a piece of research that has not been published yet, 
and it's by um, legal briefs in, in the UK, but they did a global um, research project. And one of the things that they asked firms of all sizes across the globe was if you had to invest in something in 2024, um, what would the you know three biggest capabilities be? And it struck me as not surprising. Um, and also, again, just a little bit of confirmation that firms of all sizes across the globe are saying, we need to invest in client relationship management. We need to know who our clients are, who our inactive clients are, the last time we were talking to them, the kinds of ways that we are reaching out to them, that sort of thing. I mean, we are always reminded that your client is another attorney's prospect. And if you're not staying in touch and top of mind in between um, those active matters, I guarantee you somebody else is. Um, and it was interesting that lawyers and law firms are interested in finding ways to help them with that. So let's dig in a little bit to tactically what that means. Um, BTI is a market research company that does a lot of work um, all across North America and in Europe. And they happen to be right outside of Boston. And over time, and they've been doing this for a couple of decades, over time, they have teased out by talking to thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of clients, the kind of activities that clients think drive superior relationship and superior client service. Now, we will not walk through each and every one of these today, but we thought providing you with an opportunity to look at this and do a little bit of a self-assessment assess yourself, am I excellent, good, fair, or poor at each one of these? You know, do I really understand what's going on in my client's industry? Or am I really investing off the clock in my relationship with him or her? Or am I staying active in between, you know, and, and connected to them in between active matters? Give yourself a self-assessment. The places where you're, where you're giving yourself that poor or fair is probably a great place to start in terms of action items. And then last but not least, um, as we were talking um, earlier, client feedback we think is one of the greatest return on investments that you're gonna find um, when it comes to not only keeping clients, but also finding additional opportunities, which Jill is gonna, gonna, gonna talk about. So lots of objectives um, for having client feedback and client feedback can be done in a lot of different ways, it can be done by technology, it can be done by consultants, maybe you and your partners split things up. One of the things that Jill and I will tell you is that as long as um, there is a way for clients to give you transparent, full feedback without feeling like they are providing you personally with negative commentary and that it's seen as constructive, it's incredibly powerful. Um, I won't go into all of the, the, the significant percentages that are on the slide, but I do think taking, um, taking a peek at these and thinking a little bit about how often am I spending time asking my clients what's around the corner for them, whether it's a consumer or whether it's a business, um, what kind of future needs do they have, what's changing in their life so that you are primed and positioned to either be able to help them through a referral to somebody else or thinking a little bit about how you can become a solution to some of their problems. Um, in the interest of time, let's, let's keep going and talk a little bit about growing those existing relationships, Jill. Thank you. <clears throat> so yes, uh, and when we're circulating the recording as well, you'll see some of these triggers that may induce great um, conversations and ability to source feedback in a very organic way. Okay, moving on to the third phase, growing clients. So according to LexisNexis, existing clients are 50% more likely to try new services with you and spend 31% more compared to new clients. So I can't emphasize enough here the, the whole value in the bird in the hand, grow what you have and do it strategically and slowly. There's no need to rush when you have this really strong foundational relationship. It's now about how I can grow it in the right 
ways based on all the information and resources you are able to get. So I will talk about how to think about growth in this organized manner, such as through cross-serving. You may hear cross-selling, Beth and I really like saying cross-serving instead, planning, and of course, staying ahead. So this is just an example of how you can create a client profile that's focused on knowledge sharing and identifying opportunities for expanding services. I will give you a hint. It all starts with knowing the client's business. You need to know what's going on, as Beth just said, their opportunities, their challenges. General counsels are busy. HR is busy. The business operations folks are busy. How can you help them? Is someone on leave? Can we step in interim doing some office hours, maybe adding on some, I don't know, fixed fee services during some transition period? There are so many ways when you know what's going on with the client to be able to offer things that are just going to mean the world to their day to day. Um, I will add the reverse. Don't offer things that they don't need. So you may have just brought in an absolute rock star of a lateral partner who handles leasing work. But if you know this client does not have real estate objectives currently in mind, or you're talking about other issues so much more often, don't put forward the leasing or real estate person. This isn't about you. If it's not a priority in that moment, keep it in your back pocket and just focus on them and the immediate needs. So then to guide conversations um, with clients on growing work, again, won't go through this in the interest of time, but here are questions that you can ask yourself beforehand, which helps you identify the needs, right? What, what services do we currently provide? Do we have all of the work in that subset? Maybe you, to stick with the topic of real estate, you currently do leasing work, but are you doing the land use and zoning? Are you doing the transactional aspects? those sort of adjacent aspects that you have capability at your firm, they do become the easiest. Granted, you have to know the background and you know maybe why they're not using you, who the competition is, but those become, again, that, that sort of bird in the hand opportunity to slowly and strategically expand the work. So again, these are some keys to the expansion opportunity. Jill, that is um, outstanding advice. I love that. And I just want to put a little footnote in for folks that are on the webinar that are either solo or come from small firms, one of the places where we've seen a lot of success is when a group um, of solo or small firms get together um, that have different services that they offer um, so that they're, this is not sitting down with your competition, right? If you're a divorce lawyer, not sitting down with five other divorce lawyers, but thinking a little bit about the um, the journey of a client uh, that you service and the different needs they have and creating a little bit of a collaboration among some smaller firms um, or other solos. And you effectively can basically continue to cross service. Clients will appreciate that you are introducing them to Amy, um, a lawyer at another firm who can help him or her with their issue sort of thing. Um, so just for those who don't come from a firm of a cross-selling um, model, you can create one. 100%. Thank you yeah. so much, Beth. It's sure. who's in your circle, who's in your pod, right? So very quickly, again, continuing to stay ahead, offering these off-the-clock opportunities it doesn't just stop once you get the client. In fact, it's even more important, as Beth said. Otherwise, others are doing it as well. And then finally, so we hit our 12.30 perfectly. I won't read through all the habits of successful business developers, but I encourage everyone to kind of take a second self-assessment as well along the lines of the BTI one we put out to, to think about this in terms of what you're doing. Review them to identify areas for growth, places where you may be able to mentor and make suggestions to colleagues or perhaps people in your pod. Um, and these habits really do serve as a guide to help you build stronger relationships and greater success in your practice and, and obviously in your clients' lives. So in conclusion, we have winning clients, and that focuses on engagement, visibility, understanding needs, and having that strong value proposition. Retaining clients depends on service, feedback, data, growing clients, 
entails cross-serving development initiatives, leveraging insights effectively, and it is absolutely the long game. And so with that, I will move it to a huge thank you to everyone for being here today, and we're happy to answer any questions. Well, first of all, thank you both so much. It was clear, it was concise, um, real takeaways, and that was amazing. And I think one of the things that you talk about is it's not rocket science, but it is effort. And I think that's the, the key here is that, yes, there is going to be effort in doing these things. Um, right. One of the things that stood out to me, and I could probably ask you questions all day long, um, but you talked about when there are clients that might leave because they think they might get better service elsewhere. What are some of those things about better service? What does that actually mean? So, so oh, please, Jill, go ahead. I was going to say, Jinx, I, I, the number one, because this is a question that I ask alongside our managing partners when we do client interviews and in any feedback conversation, What's the most important thing to you when we talk to our clients? It's responsiveness. It is responsiveness. Responsiveness may mean something different for everybody, but it is get back to me, acknowledge receipt, be there for me at my time of need. Don't leave me hanging, be proactive, know my business. And that is responsiveness. Beth, I'm sure I stole your answer, but I can move it to you for your response too. <laughs> Well, I, I will add on, it's responsiveness and accessibility, right? So it's not just, uh, do you call back, but can I get in touch with you? And um, we, we do, we hear that a lot. Responsiveness and accessibility is the number one service complaint, not just at the firm that, that Jill works at, but it's industry-wide. Um, and we see it a lot. We see it a lot. And um, when we talked a little bit about client feedback, you know, asking your clients what responsive means to them, does it mean a half a day? Does it mean getting back to you by the end of the week, getting back to them by the end of the week? Does it mean the next business day? What I think you'll find is that uh, different decision makers have very different ways that they define responsiveness and accessibility. And so um, learning what those are um, and putting in some, obviously they need to they, they, they need to have some boundaries, but being able to put in some communication guides that align with their expectations is really important to keeping clients happy. And, I, you know, I would say that's a great point is that you need to ask them, right? What do they want? What are their expectations as opposed to making assumptions um, and basing yeah. it on what might be acceptable to us? So again, exactly. Both. Excellent. We do have a couple of questions. Um, somebody asked for a solo or small law firm. Uh, is it more productive to market to other lawyers who are referral sources or to potential clients themselves? So Jill, I'll, I'll, I'll jump for this jump ball. I think that it depends. And I think that your information can probably answer that. Um, some people, um, depending on what their actual service is, if you are an immigration lawyer and um, there are several firms that you have really great relationships with and the labor and employment department, but they don't have immigration lawyers, and that's just a solid stream of um, of referrals for you, then, then that's your answer. And so I think when you look at all of your open matter um, or your conflict, uh, you know, sheets, hopefully what you're capturing is source of business. Is it a referral? Is it, is it coming from a referral source? If so, who is it coming from a speech? Is it coming from a website? Is it coming from another client? Is it my neighbor? You know, it's a re relationship that I've been, you know, a personal relationship capturing that and looking at that over a two or a three year period. So I would say, go back and look at the information that you've captured over the last 36 months and try to look at where are you finding the most success? But I think it depends on the practice and it also depends on um, the network. There's not a one size fits all for that. Excellent. Um, we have another question. When mentioning events to which a client might be invited, 
please suggest um, if you don't mind. So when mentioning events to which client might be invited, yeah. what? I'm happy to take this jump ball. So let's first think about one-on-one, -on -one, right? It, it goes back to knowing your client. So if you know this client is a huge hockey fan, there you go. Maybe it's tickets. Maybe you go with that client to an event. Depending on resources, maybe it's a watch party. Maybe it's a bigger ticket purchase for an event. Maybe it's, I don't know, sending, going to lunch and giving some swag that has to do with that interest. So first I would say it's about personal interest. But then as you want to get broader and you're thinking about the industries in which your clients operate or just what's going on with the economy in general, I think people are fascinated with, um, there's constant, you know, whether it's an organization and an economist is speaking, maybe you're part of the organization and maybe you're going and maybe you have an extra ticket. Maybe you're sourcing some events. Maybe I'm thinking, again, we'll keep with the real estate trend. There's BizNow. BizNow is doing events everywhere in all you know major city markets talking about the real estate industry and what's going on. Again, can you score an extra ticket? Is somebody speaking? Are you speaking? Can you secure a panel spot for this client? So there's some of that. There's some networking events. There's some social events. I think it's staying close again, back to that slide I had talked about with staying involved in organizations. If it's HR, what's going on in the SHRM world, right? So thinking about things like that on the macro level organizationally, and then also getting to know them individually one-on-one. -on -one. We've seen Grateful Dead lovers. We've seen hockey haters. It, it just, it, it spans. And so thinking personal as well. Excellent. So it does sound like it's also having a conversation with that client and really getting to know them as well mm -hmm. as a person. So that's, I think that's important. We have another question. Let me so, say one more thing, Amy. Oh, about yes, that. please. Absolutely. I'm thinking, reach out and maybe they say no, right? And then maybe it's an opportunity to say, okay, well, let's get lunch next week, right? So it's just a touch point. We're talking about those touch points to stay close. I saw this and I thought of you. I can't go. Maybe you want to go. So again, it, it it can be seen as this touch point, even if it's met with, I, and I can't do it. So again, it's just another opportunity to connect. Excellent. Um, so our next question for solo and small firms, what do you suggest to overcome the perception that they are less capable of dealing with complex, sophisticated work? That's a good one. It's a, it's a great question. So yeah. we could do an entire session on overcoming objections. It's one of my favorites. Um, so the, I know that we're speaking with lawyers and I know this was a little obvious, but in the sales world, which is really what we're talking about is how you are going to change a perception or how you're going to overcome an objection is um, bringing yourself through a process, isolate, validate, negotiate. And so if you have um, an, an attorney who can do very complex, sophisticated work and has done very complex, sophisticated work, and you hear from a prospect I'd love to hire you, but we, we really only work with, you know, the biggest firms in the city because they, they just have, you know, more capabilities for sophisticated work. At that moment, you isolate the objection. So you say, so you like to work with lawyers that have a successful track record working on very sophisticated, multi-jurisdictional, multi-issue kind of deals, matters, whatever it may be. You get them to agree, right? So isolate, validate. I totally think that makes sense. Um, we hear that a lot. Um, that's why so many of our clients come to us is because we have the big firm, um, you know, capabilities with the small firm service uh, model around us. So you're validating that it's a that it's okay that they feel this way, and then you negotiate, which is if I send you you know, just a, a few representative deals that my firm has, you know, dealt with that's either been at the company litigation or like you said, very sophisticated work or very, um, you know, blue chip clients sort of thing. Um, if we send you over a list of some of the things that we've been up to over the last short bit, over the last year or two, um, could we continue to have a conversation around ways we might be able to work together? So isolate, validate, negotiate 
all day long. Um, and by the way, no, usually the objection that's first that you hear first, oh, you're too expensive is not really the objection, right? And so when you isolate, validate, negotiate, you're going to hear, really, I don't have the budget to pay you what you're worth once you start nego- once you start that isolate, validate, negotiate, and then you can start talking to them about budget. So um, again, it could be a whole session, but that's that's what I would start with. That's, again, such helpful information. And I want to go back to um, what you talked about earlier in your presentation. You talked about closing. That's clearly an important part of this process. Closing, I know, can be such a challenge. People sometimes are anxious or uncomfortable with asking for the business. What kind of advice, um, what is what does that sound like? Um, can you provide some specifics on that? I know that's you know, a tough I, I can give you, I, I can give you a, um, I can give you an example. So there was a small firm in Massachusetts. There were five partners and three associates. Um, so small to midsize. And I was doing some coaching back in the day with one of the named partners who said, I have gone every single weekend during the summer golfing with the GC of this company. And we've, we're great friends. We have a lot of trust. Um, We talk a lot about business. We talk a lot about some of the things that we're seeing in the industry. He gets free advice for me. This has happened year over year over year. And he's never, ever hired me. And so I said, have you ever asked him why? And he was like, uh, that feels a little uncomfortable. And I said, totally get it. But I think it's worth just, just the question. You know, listen, I know that we talk about business a lot. I know that you, that you work with firms a lot. If there's ever a way we can work together, maybe there's um, a time when you ha- where the firm that you work with has a conflict or there might be something a little outside the scope that you want to, you know, talk to somebody about. You know, I'm here. And I'd love to work with you. I'd love to figure out how we can kind of help you in the business. So he called me and said, so he answered my question. And the GC said, because you've never asked. And he said, what do you mean? And he said, I thought that you didn't want to do business together because of our friendship, because you've never asked, you've never brought it up. And so I didn't bring it up because I just figured you didn't want, you didn't want to do business with somebody that you had gain this relationship with. Um, It's just a nice, and this is by the way, a true story. It's not one that I like made up. It really did happen. And within six months, they had a significant amount of work coming in from the GC and um, some of his colleagues. But um, it is hard to hear no, but I think what's important is, is that if we stop thinking about selling and start thinking about solving for people's helping people solve their problems or helping companies reach their objectives, whatever, again, whether you're B to C or B to B um, and be thinking a little bit about if it's not this, you know, then offering ways like, listen, if you've got this issue, I'm happy to just take a look at the agreement off the clock and just give you some thoughts so that you're not saying, well, why don't you hire me? And I can litigate that for you, but you're, you're basically, you know, making it easy by breaking it down into steps where let me take a look at it. Let me give you some of my reactions. Let me talk to you a little bit about what my strategy would be. And then it can turn into a yes. Right. Jill, you probably have some other really good thoughts as well. I love that story. I mean, I would just say on a much smaller scale too, we get a lot of questions like, this guy's my really good friend. This woman's my really good friend. We hang out on the weekends. Our kids are friendly. I just, I don't know how to turn it into maybe something professional. And I think one of the best lines too, and again, this is very, very small, but you may be texting, you may be friends on Facebook messaging back and forth on social media, maybe just asking to move it to the work email, right? What's your work email? There's an event coming up and I thought of you and, you know, I know we have all the Instagram and all the texting, but share with me your work email and maybe we can we can move this part to there. And that way you also are showing that you're thinking about it, you're separating the thoughts, you're making it 
you know, on a much more casual scale. So that's sort of also the shift to, um, and and I find that our attorneys are are very comfortable with something like that. I, I love that, Jill, to be able to say, I'd love to have a business meeting with you during business hours. Um, where should I, how should I contact you? How do we get together and talk a little bit about, you know, business is a, that's a, that's a great door opener. You know, I have to say, so there was a comment, um, great story and reminder, Beth, again, Jill, I think a great example. And I have to say, Beth, when you shared that story, as silly as this might sound, I got the chills. I mean, it's, again, it was just asking that question and here this other person was had assumptions. And that's the way you get past all these things is it's okay, just ask that question. So again, yeah. that was a great example. Um, so again, I could ask you, questions forever. And I do have more. So if you're willing to bear with me for a little bit longer. We also ask clients and client yes. interviews, what do you look for when you select counsel? And that question doesn't have to be exclusive to just the client relations professionals. It can be exclusive to you and your conversations with prospects, right? You're, you're on a learning mission. You need to know what these people are looking for, what qualities they're looking for in order to then meet the needs, right? If they're looking for deep local counsel in California, you may, that, it might be a no, right? Your time isn't of most value there. So you can suss that out by asking like, what's your, what's your typical criteria? And just again, beyond that, beyond that learning mission. That's a great, that's a great tip. If we're going to, if we're going to have tips, I would also suggest, please put time in your calendar twice a week, three times a week, a half an hour, 45 minutes, 15 minute intervals, whatever it is saying, I'm going to reach out to an inactive client. You know, I helped him or her with something last year. We haven't really connected. I want to reach out and see how everything is faring, how the business is doing, how their, you know, trip to Africa went, whatever it is, um, you know, give yourself time and space in your outlook calendar. And that really speaks to Jill, the activator, um, the, the connection creation cadence slide that you used from DCMI, um, thinking a little bit about how you can spend time building your relationships um, because that's really what business development is. It's relationships and helping people solve problems. It's, you know, I understand nobody went to law school to be a salesperson, but most people went to law school because they wanted to help people. They wanted to make a difference. They wanted to solve for problems. And that's what lawyers do but that's what a lawyer does and a law firm is a business. And so putting a little bit of time in your calendar so that you can, you can actually think about and spend time building those relationships. I'm always struck by lawyers put their clients business or issues before their own. Right. Um, and so they're really good about getting back to a client on a problem that a client has, um, but not always, willing to spend time thinking about what's around the corner next year for, you know, for, for my revenue stream. So please put time in your calendar. I think it's really important. Like I said, 15, 20, 30 minute intervals, two or three times a day, two or three times a week. It's amazing what your ROI will be just on that alone. I am hearing themes, two themes that keep on coming back. It's asking the question, and it is putting in the effort. Um, those, again, huge themes that continuously, um, I think, come out through your answers. Um, going back to marketing, and I know LinkedIn, for example, it's, it's free. It's a great way to keep your name out there, things like that. What do you think about print advertising at this point? What's the return on investment there and putting money behind even swag, I know that's maybe two different pieces, but it's it's putting money out. One is effort, the other is putting money out. What do you think about those things? Um, Jill, I think if we went back to your slide of what the sales process is, where you look at pre-approach, approach, right? Um, uh, you know, developing relationships, that sort of thing. 
I think when you're trying to build awareness and credibility, thinking about advertising, whether it's print or online or, you know, it could be local. It depends. I mean, if you're a Main Street lawyer and there is a publication that everybody in your town reads, then it certainly, you know, is worth looking at. Um, one of the things that I would suggest before you think about print advertising, again, assuming you're a Main Street lawyer and you're prominent in your town or want to become more prominent in your town or city, take a look at the advertisers, the professional services advertisers um, in that publication over a two or three year period. Are they getting bigger? Are they staying the same? Does it look like they're repopulating every year? Because that usually can be a little indicator of return on investment, right? You don't, uh, you can think a little bit about, gosh, every year there are new, there are new um, professional service um, advertisements. But if the goal is to try to create some awareness and credibility, I do think that I've seen a lot of success with online digital advertising versus print advertising. But again, for the right situation, um, it can be very effective. And if you're looking for more than um, just awareness and credibility building, then it has to have a call to action. Yep. I find that that B2C lawyers are so good at this, um, you know, and making sure that, you know, you know who to call, what to call for, the questions to ask yourself. If you're answering yes to this, um, I'd love to see more B2B lawyers do that as well. Um, but so I do think having a call to action is, is really important in advertising as well. I think a call to action is critical. And I, and I guess, too, with everyone effectively operating on some sort of budget, it's thinking about how to get more than one use out of anything. Right. So if you do a if you do a print piece, how do we scan it and then promote it on LinkedIn? How do we put some social media out there? How do we add it to the website that we also were, whether it's an advertisement or not, featured here? Or how do we figure out how to also be at an event? You know, it's it's maximizing what you have. So if you're writing an article, maybe the article is what you're printing for the piece versus a, here's our headshot and here's our phone number and here's our service, right? Or a checklist. And so it's using that print piece to to get as many squeezes out of the orange as possible. Um, and it's the same on the digital front too. So whatever you're doing, it's just how to maximize it. And, so. and the golden rule is the seven times, right? The force multiplier of seven times. Can you take one thing and use it seven more times in seven different ways to um, to further that that relationship building? It's a great point, Joe. This is this is just fantastic. I'm learning. Um, so we do have another comment question. Thank you so much for your pointers. Uh, this person is also a solo practitioner just starting this year. And they seem to be stuck in business development and don't know where to start. This person is now more energized to try to reach out to all their possible contacts, at least to build the relationships. And this person is also going to make a list of their contacts and targets. Any other advice that you can uh, provide for this person just starting out? Yay. And I was going to say, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel energized too. Thank you. I, uh, that is, that is exactly where to start. And also in the coaching that Beth and I do, it, that's the first step. And then taking a look at that list and kind of making it your a list, your B list, and your C list, or who are the people that actually could have the power to deliver you direct work? B list is again, you should spend some time, C list as well. But once you throw that list together, you can actually see where you should be prioritizing your time more. So it starts exactly where you said. You know, one of the things we can do is um, we can send Amy either some questions or a plan template that might be helpful to be thinking a little bit about what is it that you offer that other people don't? What is your value proposition? How do you introduce yourself? Um, again, what Jill was talking about at the very beginning is so important. Like saying I'm a real estate lawyer is just not as compelling as 
I work with, um, you know, investors and property managers to um, on class A buildings to help them with their largest return on investment. That's a very different conversation than I'm a commercial real estate lawyer. I'll tell you really quickly, one of the things that, that we use is ask yourself these questions. Who, 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 who are like, think of a client in your head that you really like their work and you really like the work that you do for them and you really like their problems. What was their problem? What did I do for them? And what was the outcome? The answer to that question, what was the outcome, is usually your value proposition, right? So I'm an intellectual property um, you know, litigator that saves big companies millions of dollars a year by helping them protect their intellectual property assets is very different than I'm an IP lawyer, right? So think about what their problem is, what you do for them, and what the outcome is. The outcome will be your value, will be a great value prop, a great door opener. Um, and yeah, and Jill, I know we're going to run out of time. I want you to jump in. Well, as you're writing the center, as you're writing down these wins or experience or, you know, as you have a recurring calendar on your outlook for spending time with contact outreach, maybe a little bit of that time is on logging your updated experience, even if it's whatever system that you have, then being able, should the time come for you to present your experience, you have it there. You're not trying to think months ago about what you're doing or going through your bills to right. find your experience. It's usable for potential articles, for potential, you know, pitch decks or sending your experience, add to the website with permission or redacting the companies. And then you can leverage that experience to be able to do so much more. This has been wonderful. We do have one more question. Hopefully we have a couple more minutes. You can hang in there. In recent years, there's been a lot of shuffling in the legal community. Any advice on maintaining relationships with individuals and firms when their respective firm individual relationships may not be harmonious? So can you repeat that one more time? Sure. Um, so in recent years, there's been a lot of shuffling in the legal community. Any advice on maintaining relationships with individuals and firms when their respective firm or individual relationships may not be harmonious. So there's a little uh, a little trouble there. Totally get it. So um, there's a difference between, you know, the relationship between an attorney and the firm or an alum and the firm um, and your former colleagues. So I think keeping in touch with the people that you trust, you respect, you know, that you would trust with your clients, that would trust you with theirs. Um, I'd, I'd break it down to individuals. You know, Jill and I, whenever we do a lot of speaking and presenting together and writing books and all that good stuff. And we always try to remind people, law firms keep selling law firms and people keep buying lawyers <laughs> um, and companies keep buying lawyers. But um, I would break it down to individual to individual and um, thinking a little bit about um, how you can engage and add value using some of the tactics and tools that Jill spoke about earlier about how you maintain, you know, and nurture relationships. But it doesn't mean you have to show up on their, at their alumni events and you don't have to be part of their alumni committee and, you know, you don't have to. So I totally appreciate and understand that there are times where you leave a firm and think, I really don't want to do business with the firm, but there might be a few people there that you want to continue to have relationships with, again, that you would trust your clients with and vice versa. So I break it down individually. Could you ask that person if we actually answered their question? Did uh, we? I don't, they haven't responded. Okay. So the person who did, and I know it was, I think an anonymous one, but if the person, um, who did ask that question is still with us. Did that answer your question? Oh, yes. Thank you. That was okay. I have seen a lot of big announced partnerships with this big British firm and this big US firm and we're a referral source. But I've also seen so many other individual firms or smaller firms also with referral relationships. So I do think there's smoke and mirrors and sometimes there's not, right? So I think there's room for everybody. This has been, we are at the time, but this has been so amazing. Again, I can't tell you how much 
I have learned oh. in this hour. Um, and again, if you two have maybe another hour to spend answering additional questions from me, that would be great. But I'm sure you have your own <laughs> jobs to do. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully everybody out there um, enjoy this as well. And uh, we're able to take some things away and put those into practice. Uh, you will get a copy of the recording. So that should come to you shortly after we end. And um, somebody said, by the way, amen to everything you said <laughs> and being and listening to you. That oh, was great. Marlon. So. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll be back next month with another webinar for busy, busy lawyers. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for the engagement. This was wonderful. Absolutely a privilege. Take care. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.